Eleventh Meeting, Thursday, June 20th, 1974. Discussion in the Morning First Question, Man 1 I had a letter from Venerable Banya Werto, so I knew that you were coming to London. I would like to ask about methods of developing mindfulness at times other than when I am sitting in samadhi, such as when I am doing work. Can this be done? Answer. How should a businessman train himself in mindfulness? What must he keep in mind and reflect on? He must continually have mindfulness and clear awareness, sati sambhajanya, to know himself, what he is doing, and why, without forgetting himself. This is how a businessman can develop mindfulness. Someone who wants to develop meditation should be able to do it within the various aspects of the work that he must be involved in. Mindfulness and wisdom dwell in the heart, which is the owner of its work, so you should be able to involve mindfulness and wisdom in every aspect of your work, or be able to use them much more than businessmen normally do. There is nothing to stop you from maintaining mindfulness while you work. Second question, Woman 1. I understand that the meditation practice of repeating Buddha should only be used when sitting in meditation. Can we use it at other times or not? Answer. When you do your work, do you have to use your mind to think about things or not? If you meditate repeating Buddha, but the jitta goes away thinking about other things, then no kind of meditation is of any use. So in doing any kind of meditation, if mindfulness is present with the heart so that you can keep the meditation object in mind the whole time, you will be able to use that meditation object any time. In this regard, there is no prohibition for those who are interested in training themselves. Third question, woman two. I feel that my heart is like a monkey jumping from one branch to another. What should I do in this case? Answer. Use the monkey catching the monkey meditation method. In other words, try to get mindfulness to keep the meditation word in mind and know it all the time. Because mindfulness is quicker than the monkey, you can get mindfulness to catch the jitta, which certainly is like a monkey. Fourth question, woman one. There is a woman who wants to make an appointment to come and see you, so as to seek help in overcoming a problem concerning her jitta. Before she came to Buddhism, she went to some Indian yogis and learned to have faith in various devas. Now she feels that the Indian devas still get into her, which makes her afraid. She used to be a well-known piano player, but she has stopped work now. Answer. This is a matter of the jitta deceiving its owner. She is deceived by her own thinking, but she believes that the devas of India come to deceive her. In truth, it is she who is deceiving herself. There is a story of a newly ordained Gammatana Bhikkhu who was afraid of ghosts. His teacher took him to stay in a cremation ground. He was told to sit there alone while his teacher went to sit some distance away. His teacher told him to sit with his eyes closed and meditate until he came to call him, and then he should gently come out of meditation. The teacher then walked a short way off, sat down for a while, and then got up and returned to the monastery. The newly ordained bhikkhu sat with his back to the teacher and did his meditation practice without any thought of fear, because he believed that his teacher was sitting watching out for ghosts. After a long time, an apprehensive thought about ghosts arose, so he slowly got up and walked to find the place where the teacher said he would be sitting. When he got there and did not see his teacher, fear arose, causing him to run back to the monastery. The teacher then said to him, I have not yet called you, so why have you come here? Then he spoke sternly to the monk, This shows that when you thought the teacher was there with you, you were not afraid, but as soon as you did not see the teacher where you thought he was, fear of ghosts arose so strong that you ran to the monastery without waiting for me to come for you. This indeed is the nature of the jitta. It deceives us without there being any need for a ghost to come and deceive us at all. Therefore, instead of Indian devas getting into her and causing her to be afraid, it is most likely that her own jitta is creating this deception. Fifth question, Man 2. How should we train in Gammatana so that it is not dangerous? Answer. If, having planted a tree, you then frequently move it from one place to another, it will not grow well. 
when you often change the method of training for samadhi, it is not likely to give good results. Train yourself to set up the breath as your object of attention and constantly be mindful of the breath at whatever point it is felt most prominently. This practice is not dangerous because the jitta is not focusing outside to search for things to bring inside and deceive you. Investigating with wisdom is similar, but the jitta must be interested in the investigation and stick to it without going off track. Sixth question, woman two. When I meditate repeating buddho, I breathe in thinking bud and breathe out thinking to. Is this a good way? Answer. There is nothing wrong with it, and it can bring peace of heart if it suits your character and you like it. But it will only bring good results if you have mindfulness. If you do not have mindfulness to supervise and control it, then no matter what type of meditation practice you do, it will not bring the desired results. Seventh question. Man 1. When doing anapanasati, we are supposed to watch the breath. But what should we look at? Do we look at the one who knows the breath as well as the breath itself? Answer. To begin with, your mindfulness will be aware of both the in and out breaths and the awareness that knows the breath. But later on, the breath and the awareness of the jitta will gradually find each other and fuse together. Then even the person who is doing the practice disappears leaving only the knowing nature of the jitta standing alone without being concerned about anything else. A Tamma Explanation in the Evening When people talk about things they like, it makes them happy and enthusiastic. For example, when an athlete speaks about sport, he can go on endlessly, even forgetting to take a meal or drink anything, for he is sustained by the fun he is having. People who practice tamma also experience this. When they talk about meditation, jitta pavana, and about the field of practice, they are likely to become more and more engrossed until they forget time. They never notice the hours passing when they talk together about the practice of tamma, while everyone present enjoys the conversation. The teacher trains and teaches his students about the attainment of samadhi, of mindfulness, and of wisdom. He talks about gradually getting rid of the kilesas by means of the power of mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and effort, and this makes them even more engrossed in following what he says. Even if the students have not yet been able to experience tamma in any of the ways that their teacher has, listening to him speak about his practice still makes them feel a sense of joy in the tamma that their teacher has come to understand. He explains it in a manner that is so fascinating that they never feel that they have had too much of it. The Lord Buddha said that the flavor of tamma is superior to all other flavors. Of all flavors, none tastes better than tamma. If the taste of tamma were not so supremely excellent, beings in the three worlds of existence would be unlikely to pay homage to and worship the tamma. In that case, the tamma would not be considered supreme, nor would it be a suitable refuge, sarana, something in which all good and honest people can have implicit faith. All Buddhists pay homage to and have faith in the Tamma, because the Tamma is a thing of true excellence. The Tamma's prestige spread out from each of the Buddhas and their respective Savaka Sankhas until it came down to us. That the knowledge of Tamma came down to us is due entirely to the fact that those who partook of the taste of Tamma with their hearts then taught this Tamma which they had known, seen, and experienced to the world, and are still doing so at the present time. They did not merely guess or suppose that the taste of tamma was superior to all other tastes, for they knew the taste of tamma and saw absolutely clearly into all aspects of tamma. Then they brought out that knowledge, that revelation, and proclaimed it, teaching the world in accordance with the fundamental truths that they understood fully, by taking their own understanding as evidence in proclaiming tamma and teaching the world. When we say tammang saranangatami, I take refuge in tamma, how deep and profound is that tamma? It is not a superficial tamma that can be understood superficially and taught to the world in a superficial way. The Lord Buddha knew the truth of tamma and taught it to the world at all levels, so those who listen to tamma should listen with interest and practice it with sincerity. As a result, they will gain tamma that reaches the heart stage by stage, until the various kinds of kilesas are all removed. In fact, 
the gilesas can be entirely removed to your complete satisfaction, so that you know it clearly in your own heart, Sandirtiko, knowing and seeing for yourself. Then, even if the Lord Buddha were sitting in front of you, you would not waste your time asking him questions, because the nature of truth would be the same for both of you. The wisest sages are very careful to make a clear distinction between Tamma and the world. If Tamma were like the world, it would not be called Tamma, because if they were both the same, just one word would be enough to describe them both. But Tamma and the world are not the same thing. Even though they both exist together, they are not one and the same thing. Although they dwell together, they are different. It's like all of us are dwelling here together at present. Bhikkhus and lay people dwelling together, but not one and the same. Men and women dwelling together, but not one and the same. Children and adults dwelling together, but not one and the same. Although we are living together, we are separate individuals. It is like this with Tamma and the world. The wisest sages practiced until they knew clearly by their own inner experience. Then they could lead the religion steadily and consistently, without acting in gross or unseemly ways to the eyes and ears of those who had faith in Buddhism. Sages mean the Lord Buddha and the Savaka Arahants who brought Buddhism for us to admire in the most beautiful and seemly way. They did not bring it in a manner that would alarm or disturb the listener. In this regard, I will tell you a story of the wise man who followed the way of the Buddha. A moral lesson. The Venerable Asaji had penetrated Tamma and become an Arahant with the other Panchavaggi, who were the first five Savakas of the Lord Buddha. At that time, Venerable Upatissa, who later became Venerable Sari Buddha, the highest of the Savakas, who was placed on the right-hand side of the Lord Buddha, was ordained in the institution of wandering religious mendicants, Paribhajika, and practicing according to their customs. When he saw Venerable Asiti, who was very beautiful and seemly in all his actions and manners, walking back and forth, and looking to the right and left with a very composed deportment that instilled great respect and confidence, he followed stealthily behind Venerable Asiti. As soon as they were out of the village, Venerable Sariputta approached and asked him who his teacher was and what his teacher taught. Venerable Asaji replied only briefly to the question about what Tamma the Buddha taught, saying, My knowledge is not great, so I will just speak of it in brief for you to hear. Ye Tamma he tu papala. All Tammas arise from a cause. When the cause ceases, they must also cease. This is the teaching of the Lord Buddha. That is all. Then Sariputta, the Paribhajaka, penetrated Tamma and immediately became Sotapanna. As for Asaji, who taught him, he did not then announce that he himself was one of the Arhants. In fact, he did not say anything at all. But Venerable Sariputta may have been able to know his attainment in Tamma when he heard the Tamma which Venerable Asaji taught him, because at the stage of Soda Patti Magga and Soda Patti Pala, it is possible to penetrate deeply and to know the truth of someone who has a level of attainment higher than oneself. Venerable Asaji was able to teach him a wonderful kind of tamma that he had never heard before, allowing him to penetrate the true nature of tamma. But it seemed from the texts that Venerable Sariputta never heard Venerable Asaji say that he was an arahant, because Venerable Asaji did not make any outward show of being an arahant. This is the first example to illustrate what was previously said. The second story concerns Mr. Gamanit who met the Lord Buddha in the house of a potter. When the Lord asked him where he was going, he said he was going to see the Buddha. The Lord asked, Where are you going in order to see the Buddha? He replied, I am going a long way, for the Lord is sure to be at Sawati. But the Lord did not tell him that he was the Lord Buddha. How profound was the subtlety of the wisest sage in not telling him, for the Lord knew all the ways of cause and effect, so he knew that to tell him would have led to some form of loss. When he had weighed up the situation, he saw that it was of greater value not to tell, so he allowed him to leave without saying anything about his being the Lord Buddha, even though Mr. Gamanit was still searching for him. As soon as the dawn came, he left the Lord Buddha. Shortly he met Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana, who were walking along the road towards him, going to see the Lord Buddha in the pottery. They questioned Mr. Gamanit, who said that he was going to see the Buddha. Both of the Savakas asked him whether when he came through that place he had met anyone there. 
He said that he met a Summerna in the pottery whose behavior and manners made one respect and trust him very much. He was diligently practicing all last night. He taught Tamma in a melodious and beautiful voice, and what he said went to the heart and was very impressive. But I am still not satisfied, so I want to go and meet the Lord Buddha. That's why I left. Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana did not say anything to let him know that the person he had met was the Lord Buddha. Why did they say nothing? Because this is the way of the sages. If anything was to be said, it was for the Lord Buddha to say it first. Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moggallana spoke together only when his back was turned, saying, Eh, that fellow has no idea that he has already met the Buddha. But since the Lord did not say anything to him, we cannot say anything either. This is how the sages immediately understand each other, so their knowledge and understanding does not lead to disagreement. Compare this to people with gilesas who only want to advertise themselves. Instead of making the effort to get rid of their gilesas, they incite them, causing them to increase all the time. In the sphere of Buddhist practice, this sort of thing tends to happen all the time. Therefore, I am anxious about all of my Buddhist friends, including Upasakas and Upasikas, and all others who have faith in the Buddha's teaching. When someone who is following the Lord Buddha's path of practice does something that is improper or disturbing, it is likely to cause deterioration and harm to him and to Buddhism. So those who practice Tamma should always be self-controlled and strive to maintain virtue, because Tamma is different from the world. In the practice of Tamma, someone who truly aims for Magga, Pala, and Nibbana until he penetrates to the desired goal of Arhatapala would not then tell people that he has attained enlightenment. Why? Because the words, I have attained enlightenment, are in no way useful as a means of helping the listener understand tamma. Actually, such a claim could only be used as a basis for vainly boasting about one's attainment in order to win people's praise. That's about all. So the Lord did not do this. Instead, he used the method of giving advice over and over again, teaching the ways of cause and effect in a manner appropriate to each individual listener. He therefore taught those who came to be trained according to their level of attainment, instructing them in ways that were suitable to the time and the situation. He taught according to reasons and results, but he did not say that he was accomplished in Tamma up to such and such a level, for this would be an unseemly thing to do. The Lord never spoke without a proper reason, behavior that is not in harmony with the status of a true sage. In the time of the Buddha, the bhikkhus had great confidence in each other, and they were very careful about this matter. Even in the present time, someone who truly follows the way of the Lord Buddha will not deviate from this track. However, this is not the case with a large number of modern-day sages, who seem to be always ready to go overboard. This shows that the excess which is spilling over the edge of the jitta is not tamma. If your knowing and seeing are true, just let them resound within your own heart. Do not let them go out externally where they can create disturbance. A sharp blade should be kept in its sheath where it will be safe. Throwing things about the place, whether words or weapons, is dangerous both to you and to others. If put away properly, they are not dangerous. In fact, you get nothing but value from them. When someone advertises boastfully, saying, I have attained Sotapanna, Sagadagami, Anagami, or Arahant, there is no reason why people who hear this should be glad. In fact, it may change their faith in him, making it gradually diminish, because they then see the Gelesas of that person quite clearly. They just feel wearied and fed up, as though there is nothing else worth respecting in that person. Therefore, all those who truly aim to practice Tamma must be circumspect and not announce Tamma of that kind outwardly. Such behavior is not the way of the Lord Buddha, but the way of a rotten fish that announces itself so that flies swarm around. People strive to gain the higher levels of Tamma, and that is good. But if they announce their attainments in an unreasonable manner, it means that they are actually troubled in their hearts, or they have a hunger in their hearts. So when they say these things, it is not nice to hear. But even though the person himself may not be aware of his mistake, he should listen when other people admonish him or warn him. 
A person who is aiming to progress in Pamma should become aware of himself and be more restrained and careful in the future. Don't turn yourself into a rotten fish within the sphere of Buddhism. The Pamma is fragrant. Because of that, it has led people throughout the world to respect and pay homage to it for a long time. There is the story of a present-day bhikkhu who lived not very long ago, while Venerable Ajahn Mun was still alive. He and two other bhikkhus went together to the mountains to practice and train themselves in the way of Gamartana meditation. While doing meditation at about midnight, this bhikkhu suddenly thought that he had penetrated Tamma and become Arahant. He then felt around in his handbag and brought out his snuff pipe, which he blew like a whistle. Peep! The other two bhikkhus who were staying with him on the mountain thought he was in danger, so they quickly ran to find out what had happened. It never occurred to them that he would blow a whistle to signal that he had penetrated Tamma, so they thought there must be some danger. "'Hey, what's the matter?' they asked. "'Nothing is the matter. I have just attained Arahant.' "'You've attained what?' "'I've attained Arahantship.' The two bhikkhus said nothing. They probably did not have the heart to. It's one thing to reach Arahantship, but, oh ho, having attained Arahantship, you blow a whistle. What level is that? This was their doubt. But they did not say anything, because they got fed up and returned to their respective locations. The next night, at about midnight, the two bhikkhus heard the whistle blow again. They thought, he's probably attained to nobody knows what level now. But they couldn't not go and see him because the three of them were living together, so it was their duty to help each other in the case of a real danger. So the two of them went to see the bhikkhu who blew the whistle and asked him, You blew the whistle again, so what further level have you attained? Have you reached the level of madness? Whatever it is, it's a real nuisance. The whistle bhikkhu announced, The other night I thought I had attained Arahant, so I blew the whistle to call you and tell you, for I was very glad. But then tonight I examined and found that... I had not attained Arahant, so I had to blow the whistle to let you know the truth. The two bhikkhus saw the funny side of it and felt pity for the madness of that whistling Arahant. They then told other bhikkhus until it became a well-known story. There is another story about the same bhikkhu. One day, while sitting in meditation, he saw a disk of bright light as big as a coconut fall down in front of him. When he saw the light, his jitta, which had attained samadhi, then went out following it. The light moved away, so he got up from where he was sitting and followed it, without knowing what he was doing. The light went up a tree, so he climbed up the tree following it. The light then floated up into the sky and disappeared. Then his awareness returned, and he realized that he was up a tree. He cried until other bhikkhus came running to see what had happened. After helping him to get down, they asked him about it. He told them that a light that appeared in his samadhi had led him up into the tree. More than two years ago, a Samanera told me a similar story. This Samanera came up to me and told me about various kinds of psychic knowledge that he had experienced. I listened until he had finished, and then I said, Samanera, you must be careful. You will grasp at shadows, or else climb up a tree following a light. I did not know what this Samarnera had been like in the past, but later on someone told me that he had already persuaded some bhikkhus to follow a light. The light led him into the forest, and the Samarnera ran after it, calling the bhikkhus to come and help him catch the light. So the bhikkhus ran after him, searching for the light. A lot of noise and commotion ensued until another bhikkhu who knew about the Samarnera came to stop them. Truly speaking, this type of psychic jitta is not to be found in many people. In fact, only about 5% of people are like this. If they are under the right teacher, people of this sort do well because they have adventurous natures. I have also been of this kind, but I knew what the jitta was up to and did not send it out externally. Sometimes light shot up through me as though flying up into the sky. It was so powerful that it seemed as if I would die at that time and there would have been nothing left of me to cremate. I understood what was happening and withdrew the jitta to its original base. As soon as the jitta withdrew, the light immediately died away. Some people must go through many weird things like this. Then they will know about various experiences that happen to those who practice. 
They can use that knowledge to guide others so that they don't go off the path or fly up into the sky even without wings. At one time I was sitting doing meditation in a village shelter at a place where there was a very fierce type of ghost that could possess people, even bhikkhus. I was doing meditation in the forest at four o'clock in the morning and saw what looked like a person, which was the fierce ghost that the villagers had talked about. His eyes were shifty and restless when he came in to where I was resting. As soon as the ghost came and confronted me while I was sitting in samadhi meditation, I instinctively ducked to avoid it, and then my body fell over with a thump. When I became aware of myself, I was very amused, for I knew that this had been done by my own jitta. We must examine what we see, and feel with wisdom to find out for sure what the truth is. Then we must find an effective way to deal with it. If we automatically assume that everything that comes our way is absolutely real and true, we will be easily deceived and go wrong. We must examine ourselves constantly and learn to know ourselves, otherwise we cannot teach others. The characteristics of some people's minds are so strange that if they do not have a teacher they will get lost, but if they do have a teacher to give them careful advice, such people can quickly make valuable gains, which gives them an advantage, but they must train themselves in mindfulness and wisdom so as to know what the jitta is up to. Then they will not become lost, and their meditation will be of widespread value more than one could imagine. The citta and the objects, aramana, of the citta can be quite bizarre, so it is difficult to describe what truly happens. But in the case of people practicing tamma who have similar characteristics and similar experiences, they can speak together and understand each other. It's similar to people who learn a technical subject. They can speak together about it, whereas others cannot understand. Questions and Answers First Question Woman 1 In England there are no good teachers, so what should we do about it? Answer If there is no teacher available, you must practice smati on your own, and at the same time constantly examine your experiences so as to keep pace with them. The jitta may have a tendency to want to know about external things that happen while doing samati. If it is released and allowed to go out to know and see things of an external nature, you may think that you have gained the deva ear, clairaudience, the deva eye, clairvoyance, or whatever. If you examine that experience without immediately believing that this is true, you will see whether the citta is merely creating its own fantasy or whether it is seeing something real. The best way is to turn around and examine yourself then nothing doubtful or questionable will happen. The important thing in practicing for proper development of your jitta in the initial stages of practice is to keep the jitta within yourself. Don't let it go out externally, for if you do, various visual images, limittas, may arise in the jitta, which you will not be able to follow and understand clearly, and that can lead you to lose your footing. But when you have become skilled at practice, there are no problems. Second question. Man 1. If we attain Upatsara Samadhi and something happens, how should we deal with it? Answer. You should report the experience to your teacher and tell him all about it. Other than that, I do not wish to give any answer, because it would be of no real value. So I will pass on to the next question. Third question. Woman 2. In this country, there are lots of books about Anitta, Dukkha, and Anatta. When we learn too much about these things, we tend to have an unclear understanding of what is what. Answer. When you learn from books and study things that are much higher than your level of understanding, knowledge may reach the level of outer space. You do not understand what is what because it is too subtle for you. The study of knowledge is different from the truth of that knowledge. We know by means of studying, whereas the noble disciples, Aryapuggala, know by means of understanding the truth, so they can abandon anitta, dukkha, and anatta, and transcend suffering, and reach the end of attainment, as illustrated in the following story. Once a mother and her child went to catch fish. Both of them were groping in the mud looking for fish when the child unknowingly grasped a snake and raised it up to show to his mother. His mother knew the danger, but her mindfulness was equal to the situation, so she said to the child, That's a fine fish. Keep hold of it tightly and don't let it go. I will come to help you. 
So the child held the neck of the snake tightly. As soon as his mother reached him, she hit the snake and killed it. Then she told her child, That was not a fish, but a poisonous snake. If I had told you that before, you might have been afraid and let go of it. Then it would have turned and bitten you. So I had to use this method. This story is an allegory for people who practice tamma. In other words, if you merely read a lot of books on tamma, then you will try to jump from atta to anatta and end up not believing anything until you have no principles to hold on to. You must hold on to and use atta, self, while you are practicing tamma through successively higher levels in the same way that you take hold of a ladder and use it to go up step by step. As you pass each step, you leave it behind. You do not hold on to that rung and try to carry it with you. In that way, you climb up until you reach the room upstairs where you want to go. Then you leave the ladder behind without trying to hold on to it. You simply enter the room to rest and relax happily. This is the way with anitta, dukkha, and anatta. Ultimately, you discard them. But you cannot discard them to begin with, because you must depend on them as the means to go up step by step, discarding each successive step along the way until you are able to discard the lot holding nothing.